Norfolk Southern drenched this adorable village in the most toxic chemical ever tested, dioxin. So this video is to clearly outline why Alan Shaw, CEO of Norfolk Southern, is fundamentally guilty of crimes against humanity. I've assembled 60 exhibits and you can find a full list of them in the description. We're going to start by exploring the history of dioxin, the toxin, and train derailments. Next, we outline the corporate decisions leading up to this disaster. After that, we'll break down the chain of events sparked on February 2nd. Finally, we'll wrap up with my recommendation to these attorneys general to immediately arrest and prosecute Alan Shaw, CEO of Norfolk Southern, for crimes against humanity. He has clearly demonstrated himself to be an urgent and present threat to the very fabric of our society. By taking clear action, the Attorneys General will establish a clear precedent for the next corporate executive who drenches thousands of civilians in the most toxic chemical created by man, dioxin. Let's get into it. In 1897, Herbert Dow discovered how to produce chlorine from salt, creating a new industry of chlorine-based products. Chlorine is toxic, and chlorine reactions are the only known source of dioxin. A chemical plant erupts in Nitro, West Virginia, resulting in a colossal dioxin release. This disaster was cleaned up by unfortunate first responders. Rabbits were placed into the allegedly clean area. Those rabbits died immediately. Other rabbits were placed slightly further away from the scene. They died in a matter of hours. These tests were hidden from government and the public. Internal memos confirm this company knew plenty about the danger of dioxin as early as 1949. I don't understand that the children are disappearing like rabbits. In 1971, one resident hired a business to spray oil on the dirt roads in Times Beach, Missouri to control the dust in their air. The motor oil was contaminated with dioxin the toxin from a nearby Agent Orange factory. In 1982, high levels were found in soil samples, prompting permanent evacuation of Times Beach. The town was declared as a Superfund site, indicating it was one of the most toxic sites in the United States. A Norfolk wreck in Sturgeon, Missouri, spills octachlorophenol, exposing the community to just one single teaspoon worth of dioxin. Everyone was forced to leave town. Monsanto denied dioxin the toxin was part of the spill. Later testing documented extremely high levels. During the trial, lawyer Rex Carr performed legal miracles, resulting in a court order for Monsanto to reveal its secret dioxin research files. Monsanto's chemical engineer testified that for seven years, they dumped 40 pounds of dioxin into the Mississippi River each day from their plant. This continued through 1977. Monsanto secretly tested corpses from dead locals. The test results showed every body contained dioxin. Dioxin was the active ingredient in Lysol disinfectant and other cleaning products. One chemist testified that they knew Lysol is recommended for cleaning baby toys while also knowing it was extremely toxic. Congress passed the Toxic Substance Control Act, giving power to the EPA. This law required companies report dioxin contamination to the government if they discovered it. Despite this, Testimony revealed in 1978 that all Monsanto products were contaminated with dioxin still completely unreported to the EPA because they didn't discover it, because they didn't test for it, because it was, quote, 
dangerous to work with dioxin. They testified further that the EPA didn't need to be notified of their dioxin products because the EPA already knew dioxin was dangerous. This type of broken logic can be found throughout nearly every environmental lawsuit. Monsanto sold dioxin products for 50 years, said their chemist, under oath. Why did Monsanto lie and fail to notify the world about dioxin? He testified that it was, quote, profitable for Monsanto to not inform anyone their products contained dioxin, the toxin. Norfolk Southern trains collide. Nine killed, 250 treated for chlorine exposure. A dozen tank cars ignite in North Dakota. Thick black smoke rolls from the wreckage as five explosions rock the town. The collision occurred after a train derailed and a train hauling oil ran into it. Railroads and unions start arguing about precision scheduled railroading. PSR resulted in staffing cuts, resulting in companies enacting strict attendance policies. These policies eliminate free time, requiring workers to be on call for weeks on end. Workers complain of stress and fatigue. Due to precision scheduled railroading, shippers complain about poor service and delays. Workers are concerned with safety due to reduced inspections. 20,000 railroad workers were laid off in 2019. Large railroads employed 30% fewer workers in 2022 versus 2018. PSR also directly impacts safety due to increased train length up to miles long in cases. This leads to derailments as well as crew stress and fatigue due to the enormous difficulty of operating trains at that length, for which the North American Railroad Network was not designed. Unions representing 17,000 workers threaten to strike. Burlington Northern sues and wins a restraining order preventing the union strike. Norfolk Southern announces $10 billion in stock buybacks and raises its dividend while refusing to provide its workers with basic benefits such as paid sick leave. The Netflix movie White Noise was released describing a train wreck, an evacuation, and an airborne toxic event. Biden announces a deal to solve the railroad strike. The deal was announced before being ratified by the unions. After firmly rejecting his deal, Biden told Congress to pass the agreement into law. The House passed the agreement along with an amendment requiring seven days paid sick leave. The next day, the Senate passed the agreement with only one day of sick leave. The next day, President Biden signed the agreement, or disagreement really, into law. A McGill University professor described his message to rail workers as, shut up and get back to work. The Biden administration's disagreement was condemned by over 500 labor historians in an open letter to Joe Biden and Secretary of Labor Marty Walsh, precisely one month before East Palestine explodes, the CDC releases an updated toxic profile for vinyl chloride, 17 years after the previous update. The train left Madison, Illinois, heading to Conway, Pennsylvania. The crew started their shift in Toledo before the train passed through Cleveland. Surveillance footage from a factory 20 miles from the crash shows flaming wheels as the train passes. Not Hot Wheels, not flaming Hot Cheetos, but dioxin the toxin in these cars. 38 cars derail, with fire damaging 12 more. One hour later, a shelter-in-place order was issued, alongside an evacuation order for the one-mile area around the railroad crossing. 
a shelter is made available at the high school. Local Emergency Proclamation Issued 9.29 a.m. February 4th The village declares an emergency the next morning, describing the event as well as the evacuation zone and shelters. Fifty cars derailed with what are described as various products, instead of calling them toxins, which they are, they pulled the firefighters out, leaving unmanned water hoses to fight the fire. Air monitoring is going on with, quote, no dangerous reading to report at this time, they say, failing to explain what chemicals were involved, nor explaining which chemicals they're monitoring in the air while also claiming there are no dangerous readings to report. Village officials and EMS hold their first conference 17 hours after the wreck. The area is still very dangerous. We are not allowing any people in that area for safety concerns. The product in question that we're most concerned about is vinyl chloride. The rail car that was carrying that is doing its job. The safety features of that rail car are still functioning. We are going to stay out of that area until Norfolk Southern deems it safe. Norfolk Southern will be opening a family assistance center. That's going to be at the East Palestine City Park Community Center. And we have zero readings of any health risks as far as anything airborne from the chemicals that they're looking for. There has been runoff in the streams, putting in safeguards to prevent any further downstream. It is a very large scene. I believe in total we had 68 entities from three states. And again, we kept doing what we needed to do until Norfolk Southern got to the point where we needed to pull back and let the safety features of the cars handle the situation. It's still under investigation, so nobody knows what's going on. They will meet with the residents themselves and uh, discuss whatever uh, problems Problems this event has caused each resident. It might be different for every person. Norfolk Southern will deal with those people one-on-one. -on -one. There's a very good team. Whenever the professionals from Norfolk Southern feel confident enough that that rail car in question reaches a point of safety, we can do a further assessment under their direction. They are the professionals. They deal with this stuff. That's their job. When they say it's time to go in and put the fire out, my guys are going to Fire. The late 70s is the last time that it took out, I think, one or two of the overhead bridges in town, and it was a train car of new cars, so there was new cars scattered everywhere. As far as the, the village is concerned, is we, we have to let the professionals take care of this. We are by no means experts. They are, so they need to handle this. They need to tell us what to do, and we will do what they say to do. And then after that, the federal government will take over, and then it's their scene. Please stay out of East Palestine until we get this under control. It was insane last night. I couldn't even get to the fire from my home. It's a dangerous situation. The evacuation notice is still in place one mile around the scene. It's still a very volatile situation. It could turn in an instant, so please just stay out of town. It's an air monitor. They're placed all around town. We also would ask people to please just stay away from them. Don't touch them. I know it's a funny looking contraption, but please just stay away from it. The EPA provided those. Uh, Norfolk Southern's contractors, contractors, they supplied some of them too. The Ohio EPA, Federal EPA, and Pennsylvania DEP. So everybody and Norfolk Southern, everybody's working in conjunction to monitor the air. The smell is because of the, the product. So Strange how they keep referring to the vinyl chloride as the product instead of toxic biohazard. The National Transportation Safety Board holds a news conference describing the train. The NTSB is the lead federal investigative agency for this derailment. We are working closely with many local, state, and federal officials. We are on scene to gather evidence. Our team methodically reviews all evidence to determine the cause and make safety recommendations. Yesterday, an eastbound train which originated in Madison, Illinois, and en route to Conway, Pennsylvania, derailed in East Palestine, Ohio. The train consisted of 141 cars and three locomotives. About 50 cars were in the derailment. 20 contain hazardous materials. The fire spanned about the length of the train cars. The fire has since reduced but remains active and the two main tracks are still blocked. Four tank cars carrying vinyl chloride were involved in the derailment and have been exposed to fire. One of the cars is releasing uh, some of its uh, pressure and that is normal. That's how that car is designed to keep it from exploding. We are monitoring the scene from a distance through the first responders and the Norfolk Southern. We have information on what 
what each rail car would be carrying. At this point, we haven't had a chance to verify that list with what's actually out there. We won't release any of that information until we can verify and confirm that because it is an active fire scene. So we're relying on the expertise of the hazardous material experts to let us know when they can get in there and uh, eliminate the fire. And then we can safely start investigating. We're trying to get information right now on uh, uh, the, uh, the hazardous material contents as to what we'll be dealing with. We're also reviewing imagery from flyovers from the state police aircraft, and I believe there was some drone footage out there too. There's also other hazardous materials in there. So right now they're all posing danger to us, so we're treating them all equally as hazmat right now. The trains carry a manifest of what all the cars have in them. Yes, we have a copy of that. We are looking at all the different chemicals. Uh, part of that, there's always a concern when you have hazardous materials. We're looking at that closely. That's why the EPA and Norfolk Southern are out there uh, doing air quality testing. Can I explain what vinyl chloride is? Do you have a bit? I, I don't have, that. I will tell you, I don't have our hazardous material expert with us at this time. The speed limit on the track, 45 miles per hour. What would I tell people that are have been evacuated from their homes? Tune in to your local first responders and do as they say. They are looking out for the best interest. They are monitoring the air quality and the scene itself. And uh, I would do exactly what they say. With that, I want to thank you very much. Once the scene is safe, the 10 hazardous material cars involved in the derailment will be moved to temporary staging areas for further damage assessment. For the safety and protection of our investigators today, the uh, drone team did a uh, full scene drone mapping of the derailment scene in lieu of having to do a walk around assessment since the scene is still not safe. This information will allow the NTSB to create a document that identified the number of rail cars and the commodities those cars were carrying. The team secured the local Locomotive data recorder. They also were able to get a forward and inward facing video and audio recordings today. They refused to release information about all the chemicals involved despite having that information. They instead cite air monitoring, which says, All good. Village officials give an update with state and federal EPA. James Justice with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, we continue to support Fire Chief with providing air monitoring and air sampling in the community and around the derailment location. Most of our air monitoring is generally background. We're not getting a lot of detections in the community, but I want to stress what the mayor and the fire chief had indicated. It's a dynamic situation. There is still assessment that needs to be done with the rail cars, and things can change at any time. And until the incident stabilized, we'll continue to do regular air monitoring in conjunction with other local, state, and federal partners, as well as Norfolk Southern, so we can notify and provide the information needed if the incident does change. Hello, everybody. Kurt Kohler with the Ohio EPA's Emergency Response Unit. Ohio EPA has been on scene since the onset of the incident on Friday night. Our role is we've been supporting the air monitoring, but primarily with water quality monitoring. What we have done is set up a series of containment dams and and, and booms which allow water to pass underneath them, yet collecting the material that's on the surface. We also have set up three aeration locations which are using high volume pumps to treat that water in place and remove those dissolved contaminants. The efforts that we are doing are commonplace. Uh, the scale of this is just increased. Do not come to our town. We are aware that a slug of the material got outside of containment prior to its installation. We are not aware of any elevated readings that would we would anticipate to have impact to human health. The containment and treatment measures we use, again, are commonplace, and we have found them to even use US EPA very effective. The water course, yes, it is local, drains all the way down to eventually the Ohio River. As far as the volume amount, we do not have an accurate estimation on that. We we did have visual free product on the surfaces within Sulphur Run, which is right here in town, and an amount got passed there. From the water quality standards, again, um, East Palestine and and all, none of the uh, water systems draw surface water. So none of these waterways have a surface water intake. You rely on a groundwater network and the area impacted in these waterways are outside your groundwater protection area. So there, we don't anticipate any impact to your, again, your public water supply. Our division of drinking and groundwater <coughs> is aware of this. I know you guys are stressing that it's so important to stay out of the town. As Ohio EPA addressed, they've been doing air monitoring and there are no recommendations for masks due to this instance. Ventilation systems, I mean the chemical obviously gets into your ventilation systems, etc. So it's probably indoors also. So who can address 
whether the stuff stays in your circulation systems through your air HVAC systems and what type of dangers there are at what levels, what parts per million are acceptable, and how close are you monitoring and how far out are you monitoring those levels. So part our air monitoring and sampling, so it's a combination. Air monitoring, um, to clarify, is gives us a general indication real time of what the concentrations of the chemicals are in the air. It's not as good as analytical, but to make real-time decisions, it's, it's our best opportunity to make real-time decisions. Currently, we have not seen anything above our established screening levels, um, but as the chief and the mayor have pointed out, it's a dynamic situation. Things can change at any moment. We still have a smoldering fire in the cars. So that's why we're going to continue to monitor until that stops and then remediation begins. So those things could fluctuate and they could change. Part of the fact sheet should probably should include what those screening levels are that we have a list of the chemicals provided by um, Norfolk Southern and in addition to that we monitor for other chemicals as well that are products of combustion so you have the chemicals themselves but when they burn they could produce other things and we don't always know um, what those chemicals are we will be reviewing those with state and federal health officials and sharing them and and if those tell us anything different than air monitoring obviously we'll let the public know but to give you specific numbers right now it's hard because every chemical is different we don't want any Everybody in that one mile because if things change get everybody out because of the active incident still going on we still have fires down there burning it, it's just not safe to get in there and 100 percent identify exactly which cars of that train which i believe had over 100 cars on it safety has to come first not only for the citizens but for those of us that are working at this scene i, I can't answer any questions based on what norfolk southern has or does not have our first round of water quality samples submitted for laboratory analysis are, are pending our containment is in place it is working and we do have that supplemental treatment going on in sulfur run the air is still safe i just want to reiterate that James Justice with the federal EPA steps into the scene with a strong wind of air monitoring as a valid excuse for not evacuating a large radius around the colossal dioxin spill. Looks like he's done this routine a few times, huh? In a press release later scrubbed off their website, Norfolk Southern plainly offers just $25,000 to the town for exploding toxic biohazards in the heart of their community. Despite removing the article, you can still find the original copy on this website that records historical snapshots of other websites. Looks like Norfolk Southern learned the hard way you can't scrub a toxic spill off the internet either, because every action leaves residue. Everybody good? Governor Shapiro and I have been talking pretty much non-stop for the last several hours. We've been getting briefings. The railroad has a serious concern. They describe an explosion as potentially catastrophic versus a controlled release. We have decided that that controlled release will occur today at 3.30. Urging uh, everyone, actually ordering them to leave. Following new modeling information conducted this morning by the Ohio National Guard, we have been in consultation with the Defense Department. We've also been in consultation uh, w with the manufacturer uh, of <clears throat> the product. If you'll look over here, the controlled release of the toxic chemicals also has the potential to be deadly if inhaled facing grave danger of death. In the orange area are at risk of severe injury, including skin burns and serious lung damage. I'm Master Sergeant Hurst. I'm the primary modeler on scene. Uh, I can tell you uh, we have extensively worked with the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, the, the railway crew themselves and EPA in determining uh, what went into this model. We've decided amongst ourselves that this model that you see here best represents uh, the reality of the situation. As new information becomes available, these also update, and they have quite frequently throughout the day, uh, and they should uh, absolutely evacuate if not already done so. Norfolk Southern Railroad. Uh, the process that we're going to do today 
Uh, we're going to allow the material to come out of the tank car into a pit. Inside that trench will be flares that then will light off the material. This allows us to control that operation, so that's what we're going to be doing later on today. Based on the uh, amount of material in there, it could burn anywhere from one hour to three hours. So we want to do it in the daylight, you know, and, and you it's want better for everyone for us to do it then. If we don't do that, the car could continue to polymerize and the entire car will break apart. We can't control where that goes. So that's the reason for doing this, get moving on this. We want to be able to control that situation. We have real-time monitoring that can detect most of the chemicals of concern. This controlled burn, if you will, things can change. We will constantly uh, reassess and revise uh, what you see here on this model. We will continue to revise. Specifically, uh, the, the tanks we're concerned with right now are, are filled with vinyl chloride. The burning of those is going to create two uh, byproducts uh, that we're primarily concerned with. And we, we've been working closely with the toxicologists uh, and EPA to confirm that our math is right. Anytime something changes, we, we reassess and re-advise. But according to North Southern, they believe that two cars that are completely full, you have three other cars that are half yeah again i mean the the new information of course is what we what we have given you the, the numbers that have given to me as we as we did this uh was a total uh basically a total of of potentially 30 people i don't think we know that yet <clears throat> nobody knows uh I, I if anybody wants to give any information but we don't we don't know that so it's not going to be immediate it's not going to be quickly but we did not want to take any chances and people were told, if you have children, uh, you're subject to arrest um, if you do not leave with these children. And um, we don't know what we don't know. I would leave if I was in that, in that area. The individuals we have on scene have done this before. We use air monitoring. So we are urging our residents to leave as soon as possible. We're still into the one mile evacuate, recommended evacuation zone. Uh, you know, we were concerned. Bigger zone, is my understanding. Everything in here in the state of Ohio, we have already hit so that we can urge anybody, if they're still there, the necessity to get out because of the volatility of this. Uh, we just want them to be safe. That's, that's all we want. That's and, all I've wanted from the start of this. And, and then the new information should up everyone's sense of urgency. Uh, and their sense of danger. If you're in that red zone, uh, you're likely of you know, very possible death. And if you're in the yellow zone, uh, certainly severe long-term injuries, which we hope if anyone is still left in those zones, they will take that information and decide that they need to leave. Anybody know how long it takes to dissipate? I don't think we know. Do I don't think we know, and that's what the air monitoring will suspend. You know, the, the air monitoring will continue. The EPA has come in very early and started the monitoring, and they're going to continue to do that. And so that information will be disseminated to you and the news media so that that can get out to the public. All right, anybody else? Let me, look, let me just close uh, by, again, urging uh, everyone in Pennsylvania and Ohio who's in this area, you know, you need to leave. You just need to leave. We're ordering you to leave. Uh, this is a matter of life and death. Uh, what's different now is we know that something is going to happen. Controlled release will actually take place and you are in imminent danger. You're in, you need to leave immediately. That doesn't mean that you should try to go as close as you can to that black line. No, th this isn't a, a, you know, a, a spectacle. To, to watch in a lawn chair. You should be very cautious in this area. In order to provide an extra layer of safety, working again in conjunction with Norfolk Southern, we are going to shut down the power in that area. It's gonna get dark in here real quick, so don't hang around. Okay, thank you. Scientists would later confirm this was a vent and burn, not a controlled chemical reaction. 40 minutes later, the toxic cloud was identified from high-resolution radar. Governor Josh Shapiro gives an update on the vent and burn on the Pennsylvania border after immediate public concern throughout the region. 
Shortly before 5 p.m. this afternoon, in consultation with their emergency responders, Norfolk Southern carried out the recommended course of action, beginning the controlled vent and burn of a train car carrying vinyl chloride to prevent an uncontrolled explosion. That process should be completed quite shortly. It was alarming to see the big plume of smoke and the fire, but I want to reassure Pennsylvanians that the process is proceeding as planned. The EPA is working with our Department of Environmental Protection to continue monitoring the air and water quality closely. Thus far, no concerning readings have been detected. Our response has consisted of two parts, with traffic control to keep people from coming in and harming themselves inside that, inside what may be a hazardous zone. The second part of the response, uh, as we saw before the detonation, they provide mapping about the consequences of whatever the incident was. And now on the other side of the incident, now that we've seen the controlled release, uh, their job is working side by side with the EPA and with the railroad uh, to do things like air monitoring, very well-trained person, personnel to include a nuclear science officer who are here on site uh, to provide real-time or near real-time data to the incident commander for making tough decisions. Through a series of containment and recovery points, we operate these through contractors with Norfolk Southern. We continue to monitor these, uh, collecting material using um, vacuum trucks and implementing aeration points. We've also um, daily sample water quality in Sulphur Run and all the um, tributaries leading down to the Ohio River. Once the Ohio Department of Health, the United States Environmental Protection Agency in conjunction with the East Palestine Fire Department and Norfolk Southern Railroad have determined that this is safe for East Palestine residents to return to their homes. And quite frankly, once I feel it's safe for my family to return, we will lift that evacuation order and start returning people home. We'll open it for questions. The first process is to make sure that the air in the community within the evacuation zone is, is safe to return. Uh, obviously there's still ongoing operations and we want to get enough data to ensure that that's not going to change to provide expert and subject matter expertise on the safe values that we should be seeing in and on the screening process for those involved to re-enter the home. We are referencing subject matter experts to give us that data of what safe limits are in order to get these people home. I want nothing more than to get my residents back home. I can't do that without that data. All right, I have to know what those numbers are. I can't stand here and tell you exactly what they are. I can't tell you what exactly we're looking for. Tell us what substances you're looking for that you're trying to measure. Sir, we're, we're looking at everything. I, I, I can't say we're singling out any one thing. If I could give you an estimate, I would so gladly give that to you. I can't. Um, at the current time, all the cars have been stacked out of the way so the track can be installed. We are working as hard as we can, but public safety is our utmost importance, okay? We're, they're out there doing all the air sampling tonight. We expect them to be re reviewing that data overnight, and we'll see what the data comes back at. I can't speculate. Yes, we have been air monitoring throughout the incident, and after the, the operation that took place by North Norfolk Southern last night with the controlled burn, we've been able to safely move our crews largely within, as Peggy indicated, so we've been focusing largely on the air quality within that one-mile evacuation zone. We've been doing that throughout the day and throughout the night, and we're going to process that data and give our recommendation to the incident commander in the morning. Very few detections, and the te detections we have been seeing for the chemicals we're monitoring for have been very low. Right. It's, it's partly the air thing, and, and part of the, re the reoccupancy plan or return safe home plan that we're working on based on the data uh, will be making it an optional for people who want their homes screened to take readings inside, inside their homes. But at this point, we, we don't know if decontamination or cleaning will be needed until that happens. So I, I don't think we have a medical expert here, unfortunately, tonight. I stand corrected. Major Derek Dunnigan with the Ohio Army National Guard CST. Um, I'm uncertain who asked the question, but whoever did, could you please repeat? Irritation, everything that people might be experiencing. 
With any type of air contamination or potential air contamination, uh, fires or whatever, there are particulate matter that can enter the air. So lung irritation could be a possibility. I cannot say whether their irritation is caused by the event or another environmental factor. But if uh, I would say if anyone is having any type of symptoms they're concerned about, that they should speak with their primary care provider or seek treatment at a local hospital. And we're only going to continue to downgrade that posture uh, throughout the night and into tomorrow. We have a, we have a very strong community here. Uh, everybody's just on edge. Frustration levels are high for everybody. It, and it, you know, for some people it will never be good enough, but you know, we're going to demand that, you know, there's still constant monitoring and, you know, we're, we're, but you know, Norfolk Southern is going to be responsible for it. They're, you know, they're going to take care of it and we're going to make sure that, you know, that happens. But I think as a community, it, if anything, this has made us stronger, uh, the outpouring of, uh, donations of food, uh, drinks, uh, you know, of course, you know, you're always going to have a few on social media that are experts and know everything, but for the most part, you know, I'm proud you know, of our community. We're all new to this, so we're trying our best. That's all I can say. So I, I am by no means an expert, uh, even though I've heard so much about chemicals in the last four days that, you know, it's made my head spin. Uh, I'm expecting them to do the right thing. I hope they will do the right thing. We are, we have to rely on the experts for this. Uh, the Ohio EPA, uh, the, the US EPA, I, I am positive they're gonna be here for a long time. Uh, we have to use, you know, and the, the contractors for Nor Norfolk Southern too. I understand they work for Norfolk Southern, but we have to also rely on them for information too. Press release from Railroad Workers United. They write, the root causes here are the same ones that have been singled out repeatedly, stemming from the hedge fund initiated operating model known as precision scheduled railroading. The group noted that the immediate cause of the wreck appears to have been an 1800s style mechanical failure of the axle on one of the cars, an overheated bearing, leading to derailment and then jackknifing tumbling cars. There is no way in the 21st century, except for a combination of incompetence and disregard for public safety, that such a defect should still be threatening our communities, they wrote. 40% of the weight of Norfolk Southern 32N was grouped at the rear third of the train, which has always been bad practice. The statement continued, this fact made the wreck dynamically worse. Increasingly, the PSR-driven carriers, driven to cut costs and crew time by any means necessary, cut corners and leave crews and the public at risk. The crash in Ohio has been years in the making, the group added. What other such train wrecks await us remains to be seen, but given the M.O. of corporate railroads, we can no doubt expect future disasters of this nature. Governor DeWine holds a follow-up press conference two days later. So I think we have some uh, good news. Yesterday, the United States EPA, Ohio EPA, and the 52nd Civil Support Team collected air and water samples from the evacuation area. These agencies feel it is now safe to be in the evacuation area. With the full support and backing of Governor DeWine, I'm happy to announce that the evacuation order is now lifted. We understand that this incident caused an interruption and inconvenience in our in all of our lives. However, we came together as a community and put safety first, avoiding what very well could have been a tragedy of epic proportions. I have never been more proud to be a member of East Palestine community and your fire chief. We've been conducting that kind of air monitoring 24 hours a day. Our partners and con contractors for Norfolk Southern have been doing the same. We've pr had assistance from the Ho Ohio National Guard civil support team. And all that data combined together is accumulated and we review it to show that the air quality in the town is safe and led to the decision for the chief fire chief to lift the evacuation. Right. As again, Ohio EPA Emergency Response Unit uh, has been here 
years since the onset of the incident. We have been tasked primarily with the protection and monitoring of the water systems, the waterways, and we do agree and glad to see the safe return of the residents here to East Palestine. Uh, the unfortunate side of these incidents at the onset is material has entered the waterway. Those were immediately toxic to fish, but all the information and data to date is it has still been protective for the drinking water uh, as it applies for drinking water standards. Working with Norfolk Southern and water samples throughout uh, Sulphur Run, Leslie Run, Little Beaver Creek, and even the Ohio River are being conducted on a daily operation. Uh, the first thing I want to go over is all the cars have been cleared from the rails. Those cars, we'll be working on those over the next several weeks and uh, preparing them to have them removed from the site. We will have heavy equipment moving in there. That'll be where we'll be moving the cars. If you feel you need an air test done on your home before you enter it, you could go to the assistance center and they will set that all up for you. We will send our trained people from our contractor and they'll come down and assist you. Basically, it was explained to me the air, which obviously we're most concerned about, everybody breathes the air, that the readings are basically similar to what they would have expected prior to the train wreck. Primary driver was vinyl chloride. We had, and then not, not only the vinyl chloride, there's a couple other chemicals related on the rail cars to monitor for those, as well as combustion products. As, as those things burn, they produce additional chemicals. So that controlled burn the other night was so important to get right because there was a potential for those contaminants to be released. We had a few detections right at the site. Air monitoring data we've collected so far is good, but as remediation continues, there may be issues with that. What could precision scheduled railroad have to do with the axle failure that caused it the rail end? Precision scheduled rail Roading is a management process. Safety is number one with Norfolk Southern. Uh, as you saw and heard, this is a very unfortunate event. I have to work with health officials and the, the experts to tell me. I don't I don't know that information, so I have to work with them. We're going to have to work with the EPA, the federal EPA, and we're going to have to find out what you know what's going through our town. We expect Norfolk Southern uh, to have answers to exactly what happened and candidly to explain what they're going to do to prevent that from happening here or someplace else in the future. The burden is upon them. Uh, Norfolk Southern will pay for it. I heard some commotion back there, but obviously I couldn't see through there. So let me just say that uh, a reporter should be allowed to report live or to tape or whatever they want to do anywhere in this press conference. Uh, that happens frequently. There'll be a press conference going on and someone wants to report. They have every right to do that. So I don't know what happened. We will certainly find that out. If I'm doing a press conference, if someone wants to report out there and they want to be talking to the people back on channel, whatever, they have every right to do that. So that was wrong. Again, I didn't see it. I heard a commotion. So all I can say is that person had a right to, to be reporting. They should have been allowed to report. If they were in any way hampered from reporting, that certainly is wrong. And it's not anything that uh, I approve of. In fact, I vehemently disapprove of it. Yes. So the, the, the fire is out. We got notified of that earlier today, and that had a lot to do with basing our decision on lifting this evacuation order. Uh, Norfolk Southern is working real close with us on that. So. During the news conference announcing the lifting of the evacuation order, reporter Evan Lambert was arrested by Major General John C. Harris during a live report. Twelve officers followed General Harris to confront Evan Lambert, and General Harris is clearly seen assaulting Mr. Lambert. Charges were filed against Mr. Lambert for, quote, resisting arrest and criminal trespassing. Asked about the arrest, Department of Defense Press Secretary Brigadier General Patrick S. Ryder said this. We uh, emailed you police body camera footage showing a National Guard general in Ohio pushing my colleague and having to be escorted away from him this week. We asked the Ohio National Guard for comment, but do you, as a spokesperson for the Department of Defense, condone such conduct by a commissioned officer of the U.S. military against an American journalist? Yeah, so let me be clear. Uh, the answer is no. That, that's not acceptable behavior. Uh, the Secretary of Defense, the, the Department of Defense, uh, absolutely supports, uh, strongly supports, a free and independent press. Uh, so again, I'd refer you to the Ohio National Guard for any comments uh, about that particular incident, but I can assure you that uh, that is not acceptable behavior. Still, no charges have been filed against John Harris for violating Mr. Lambert's constitutional rights. On February 10th, Allen releases his cleanup plan. This document confirms on February 8th, when the evacuation order was lifted, all rail operations resumed. 
suggesting heavily that the vent and burn allowed Allen to resume making money very quickly. This document also provides zero detail about what chemicals they're testing the air for. West Virginia American Water said that it's installing a secondary water intake in case they need to switch to an alternative water source. This is a large investment for what the EPA claims is not a problem at all. There's no need for concern. Allen announces an additional $1 million of support to East Palestine, or roughly $212 per resident. Maybe they realized the initial offer of $25,000 looked a little stingy. Eleven days after the crash, the EPA finally released a list of the toxins on board the train, providing zero guidance or confirmation about any combustion byproducts, such as you know, dioxin. Governor DeWine provided his third news conference on the subject for the first time revealing that the Norfolk Southern train was not classified as carrying highly hazardous materials because I had discussion with the railroad. I brought Pennsylvania Governor Shapiro uh, in, in that trying to just weigh the risk. So the release uh, occurred, as I recall, about 420 uh, outside that area. And the air continued to be good. People were then let back. In. Uh, this train apparently was not considered a high hazardous material train. Therefore, the railroad was not required to notify anyone here in Ohio about what was in the rail cars, even though some rail cars did have hazardous material on board. Uh, frankly, uh, if this is true, and I'm told it's true, uh, this is absurd. The spill did flow to the Ohio River during that initial slot, but the Ohio River is very large, water body that's able to dilute the pollutants pretty quickly. To track the contaminant plume in real time, it's moving at about a mile an hour. We have strongly encouraged all of those people on private wells. We're strongly recommending those who have not had their water source checked use bottled water. Uh, this is going to be particularly important if you are pregnant, if you are breastfeeding, or if you are preparing formula for an infant. So the bottom line is that from the very start of this, we have taken every step possible to assure that people's safety was first and foremost. You said that the water is safe the community water that's been tested. And should people just go ahead and do bottled water in the meantime? Yeah, we are recommending that people in the community consider using bottled water. You know, from my point of view, using bottled water for a short period of time is pretty easy to do. For right now, I think bottled water is the right answer. What could that impact be on the current health of those who might have been intaking this water? Really talking about those who have municipal water sources coming off of the Ohio River. We know that there is a, a plume moving down the Ohio River. So it's um, on its way around West Virginia now. And so all of those water systems are in constant communication on when it may uh, be at their intake, and they're either shutting down and or using the treatment available that they have on site. So, so all of the treatment being done at those water systems take out any contamination before it finished water. So I, I can't envision that there would be any risk that has already occurred from the drinking water systems on the Ohio River. What's in the plume? The fire combustion chemicals that we detected that are showing up. We showed hundreds of, of detections on that initial slug that went through into the Ohio River. Um, there could be multiple. The, in terms of some of the symptoms of headache, etc., unfortunately volatile organic compounds share with a host of other things the ability to cause very common symptoms at the lower levels. So headache, eye irritation, nose irritation. The air sampling in that area really is not pointing toward an air source for this. And secondly, we're encouraging people to use bottled water, particularly if they're on a private water source. I would encourage them to make a switch immediately. Um, the federal government is conducting an investigation to determine why this crash occurred. Look, Northern Southern is responsible for this problem. Uh, we fully expect them to live up to what the CEO committed to me, and that is that they will pay for everything. If they don't, we've got an attorney general. Look, they're responsible for this. They did it. You know, the impact on this community is huge. Not just the physical problem that might be caused, but the terror. Um, 
they're going to be held accountable. The farther it travels down the Ohio River, the more it is dissipating, the less uh, the less concentrated the contaminant plume is. So the farther it heads down the Ohio, the much less risk that it is, and we haven't seen a risk even at closest points to East Palestine. So we would not envision anything from this point forward impacting any of the further drinking water supplies. And I will say that butyl acrylate was a brand new chemical that we did not have a methodology for. Yeah, my understanding when we're dealing with a railroad, the uh, governor's uh, power is very limited. This is generally a federal government thing that, that we they basically preempt us on the control of the railroads. I think that I would be drinking the bottled water and I would be continuing to uh, find out what the tests were showing as far as the air. I would be alert and concerned, but uh, I think I would probably be back in my house. People can feel very confident in that fact, coupled with the fact that there continues to be air monitoring. So that's very good. The, the one thing that hasn't been discussed today is the giant column of doomsday-looking smoke that went up after the quote-unquote controlled release and burn. Uh, are we just supposed to believe that that just disappeared, that that went up into the atmosphere and, and, and just went away? Uh, that had to have come down somewhere. Uh, there has to be a blanket of whether it's soot or chemical. I don't know what the science is in regard to that. And that quality of air remained good the entire time. But I cannot answer your question, what happens when that, when that goes up? The surface water is heading to the Ohio River. Governor DeWine said he has no idea what happens when the plume goes up. It seems like something he might want to figure out. Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro calls out Norfolk Southern for, quote, inaccurate information. In a letter to Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw, Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro expressed serious concerns over the company's handling of the February 3rd train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, located less than a mile away from the Pennsylvania border. My opinion is that this sounds like the governor blindly followed the guidance of Norfolk Southern to conduct the vent and burn, and after reviewing the aftermath versus what they sold him, he might have felt lied to. Seven days after his arrest, charges are dropped against Evan Lambert, the reporter arrested during Governor DeWine's news conference. No update was provided on charges being filed against John C. Harris. All I know is I went to bed one day and woke up in the middle of a uh, toxic super site the next day, so it's like, I don't really know other than that. Uh, We've heard from the EPA that the water is safe to drink. He said there is no detection of contaminant in East Palestine's uh, municipal water system. The Ohio EPA is confident that the municipal water is safe to drink. Are you confident enough, sir, that you yourself would drink it? Absolutely. Uh, if I was there right now, I would drink it. Heard from a health director yesterday who recommended that residents should consider buying bottled water. Are you, are you, are you saying that, 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 that that's off? Uh, you can drink that water. That water has is, is been tested. Uh, it's, it, it's a well. Obviously, a town hall going on here tonight in East Palestine. Uh, we got a statement this evening, Norfolk Southern, saying that while they understand the frustration and anger from the community, there are health concerns uh, for, for their own. And because of that, they won't be here. Do you, do you think they should be here tonight? Yeah, absolutely. It's absurd they're not there. It's wrong they're not there. They created this problem. They need to hang in there. Cowards. Absolute cowards. They don't want to answer our questions. They don't want to have to confront everybody that way. How can you look all these citizens in the face and tell them there's nothing wrong? How can you do that? We're not going to give up. The people here in this community are not going to give up until we get what we want. You have these boxes in your community. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing it, it's zeroed out. There's zeros across the board. Still, you're not moving back in. Why? I don't believe the, the reading's accurate. You still have concern? Mm -hmm. It makes me feel like I shouldn't be in the area. Smell can, can linger and be there long after uh, when there's no discernible problem with the air. We can just tell them that, uh, but I understand you know, their reluctance. We intend to hold the railroad accountable. Morgan & Morgan files a lawsuit against Norfolk Southern alleging they dumped 1.1 million pounds of vinyl chloride into East Palestine, Ohio, 
I'm not sure Norfolk Southern could have come up with a worse plan to address this disaster, said attorney John Morgan. Residents exposed to vinyl chloride may already be undergoing DNA mutations that can linger for decades before manifesting as terrible and deadly cancers. The lawsuit alleges Norfolk Southern made things worse by, quote, blasting the town with chemicals as they focused on restoring train service and protecting their shareholders, according to the highly regarded law firm. The complaint goes on, saying, rather than taking safer and more expensive efforts to properly clean up the spill, Norfolk Southern chose a cheaper, less safe method, lighting the toxins on fire, creating a one million pound chemical burn pit and releasing dioxin the toxin into the atmosphere. The firm has successfully litigated against major corporations in cases such as the 2010 BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. You may remember this is what that looked like. How do you, having spent your life assessing things like chemical spills, how do you assess the condition of East Palestine? There was somebody from Darlington, Pennsylvania, a cloud that had went over his property, and you could see fallout coming out of the cloud going onto his property. And I'm looking at it and I'm saying, you know, it it reminds you of one of those apocalyptic shows where the nuclear fallout's coming out. And I thought about it, I says, well, yeah, we basically did nuke a whole town just to get a railroad going, you know, back in service. Uh, News media were not being told the truth. They didn't know what they had. You know, that flies in the face of logic. Have your fire department and other, you know, responding teams take care of it. You should know what the heck you've got. They had unmonitored hand lines there keeping the tankers cool. And then I find out that they're pulling the unmonitored t- uh, hand lines, keeping the tankers cool. I said, well, that's just going to cause the, uh, the, the tanker cars to heat up, which they did. And then they announced that one was during, you know, very near catastrophic failure. And then I was told, no, they're going to detonate all these cars so that it doesn't happen. And I could tell you, uh, Mr. Carlson, I've been looking at rail incidents over and over because in Youngstown, Ohio, there's three rail lines that run through our town. So as a chief... And as a uh, instructor, I trained my guys to anticipate stuff. And I would go case study after case study after case study. And I've never once in 39 years ever heard of them blowing up train cars, right. dumping all the chemicals into a trench, and lighting them on fire. I was, you know, I, I was dumbfounded. And up in this plume was all the incomplete combustion products of everything that was there. You know, there's a lot of questions. Uh, you know, and, and the answers came slow. First you get, well, now we've found... Uh, vinyl chlorides in the water. Well, yeah, everything was drips and dribbles. Instead of, you know, one of the things I learned is you tell the truth, you tell it all, you tell it first, and you tell them how you're going to solve the problem. And none of that was forthcoming. And I began to worry about what the end result with this was going to be. They had evacuated one mile, and I was telling the media, they better do like one and a half, two miles. Well, subsequently after that, they went to two miles. And then Within a few minutes, they were bringing, or a few days, they were bringing everybody back. And that was pretty much just in time to open up the rails. And there was no testing. There's got to be some plan going forward in this cleanup and recovery to test. State Fire Marshal says firefighters likely didn't know about trains toxic cargo. First responders rushed to put out the fire in East Palestine, but the Ohio Fire Marshal stated that they were clearly unaware of the chemical weapon burning in the air around them, as nobody was in hazmat suits. Because the train was not classified as highly hazardous, none of the authorities had a list of the chemicals involved. Firefighters often don't know what they will encounter, so it's our responsibility to keep these innocent heroes prepared for whatever fresh hell corporate America serves up this week, and take the necessary precautions as such. We already have heard from Fire Chief Keith Drabeck that they were fighting the fire until Norfolk Southern arrived and told them to stop. Notification of the material being transported is essential as it provides advance notice during the dispatch before anyone even arrives. Firefighters obviously need to be in hazmat suits when working in toxic smog. This is a very bad piece of the puzzle for Norfolk Southern. 16 days after the wreck, no tests for dioxins have been conducted. The EPA's handling of this is highly concerning. Despite the known presence of dioxin the toxin, the EPA failed to conduct any testing for it, effectively covering up the potential danger to public health. 
This lack of transparency and responsibility is unacceptable, and the EPA must be held accountable for such inaction. There are two types of lies, a lie of commission and a lie of omission. They obviously know what dioxin is. Criminal mastermind Alan Shaw arrived 16 days after the wreck, showing up to meet with local officials, according to a press release from the company. Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw in the command center. This has been devastating to this community, and I, I want to make sure you understand I am terribly sorry. Shaw says he was at the meeting, in person, in which the decision for a controlled release was made. What was his reaction when he saw the result and the cloud of smoke rising into the sky? Frankly, that, that told us that there was success and that the, the opportunity for a much riskier event occurred because of what was in, those, what was in the rail cars. Shaw says Norfolk Southern is offering $1,000 a person to everyone in the zip code. Are you making them sign documents to tell people that they won't sue further or they can't ask for more money? No, not at all. All they have to do is sign their name and say they've received $1,000. We're making a lot of progress. He could not say, however, where the soil and liquids being collected are being shipped off to. We're taking it to landfills that are designed to handle that type of material. What city and state? I don't have that information. You know, I understand why this has created a lot of national attention, right? I understand that completely. And when asked about the calls for stricter regulations in the railroad industry. What we're trying to do is work really closely with the local leaders, getting information right. The Beachwood Athletics Department decides to forfeit a girls' basketball playoff game against Crestview High School due to the health and safety concerns given their proximity to the train derailment eight miles away. Greater Cincinnati Waterworks is reporting there are no detectable chemicals in the Ohio River intakes as Norfolk's contamination reached the Cincinnati area. This would imply that the chemical slug had fully dissolved into the local ecosystem by that point, or they didn't have the ability or will to test for the full spectrum of leaked contaminants. Norfolk Southern announces a total of $5.6 million to East Palestine for their inconvenience, roughly $1,200 per resident. 224 times more money than their initial offer of 25000 yet still not close enough to compensate for derailing 4,700 lives. EPA top man Michael Regan holds a press conference. Just two weeks ago, tragedy struck this small, close-knit community. I recognize that no matter how much data we collect or provide, it will not be enough to completely reassure everybody. We're not gonna leave this community behind. Norfolk Southern will pay for cleaning up the mess and the trauma that they inflicted on this community. Full transparency is the only option. And I can assure you, no details will be overlooked. In no way, shape, or form will Norfolk Southern get off the hook for the mess that they created. Uh, the one request that I keep hearing is this, don't leave us. When all the TV cameras are gone and the world turns to something else, uh, the community is going to be left here to handle this problem all on their own. Those local officials have just done an extraordinary job. Pennsylvania continues to see no concerning air quality readings. The combination of Norfolk Southern's corporate greed, incompetence, and lack of care for our residents is absolutely unacceptable. They chose not to participate. They gave us inaccurate information and conflicting modeling data. They refused to explore alternative courses of action. In sum, Norfolk Southern injected unnecessary risk into this crisis. Nothing can make up for the damage that's already been done. In the face of Norfolk Southern's arrogance and incompetence, I get it. I know you're worried about your children and your families. There are some bright spots in this tragedy. You've heard from the authorities at the state and federal level that accountability is certain. Let me define what that means. You, the citizens of East Palestine, get to determine what that long haul finish line is. We are here 
We are going to be here until your questions are all answered and until you are convinced that you can return to normal life. That's what the finish line looks like as your voice. I'm not a chemist. I'm not an engineer, but I represent you. And in that regard, I work for you. It's not the other way around. The concerns are long-term concerns. And as I talk to people today, how's it going to be in a year? How's our water going to be in a year? How's it going to be in two years? Um, and people have, have the right to expect that from us. This, this community has been traumatized. We have to look at train safety. Uh, these trains are longer and longer and longer. They're carrying toxic material. No other community should have to go through this. You mentioned about consequences. Are we talking about the Commonwealth will take criminal actions against, uh, against uh, this company? Attorney General Yost uh, will take the appropriate action. He's the Attorney General of the State of Ohio. He will certainly take the appropriate action. I guarantee you that. For Pennsylvania, I'm the former Attorney General of Pennsylvania. Um, we've made a criminal referral to the acting Attorney General in Pennsylvania. You heard both governors talk about rail safety. I have already begun engaging with my congressional colleagues. It is my view the Norfolk Southern wasn't going to do this out of the goodness of their own heart. There's not a lot of goodness in there. They needed to be compelled to act to hold them accountable. There's concern among the residents of East Palestine that the water, when it was established, safe to drink. It was determined to be so based on tests that were done in conjunction with Norfolk Southern. Director of the Ohio EPA, we walk you through the testing. So the Norfolk Southern contractor, <clears throat> Did AE come? They did their own testing. That same sample at the same time it was collected by the county and sent to a separate lab. That testing also came back. A third layer of protection was the local public water system testing their finished water. That was clear of VOCs as well. We also understand where the municipal wells are in relation to the accident and have no suggestion that the contamination would get there. Thank you. A lot of people have been complaining about sore throats. They say that their face is burning. Do you believe that is connected to the train derailment? You know, I believe uh, people and what we're doing is we're asking them to seek medical attention and rest assured we're going to hold Norfolk Southern accountable. And I also know that there's been a concern uh, by citizens, uh, uh, very understandably, uh, that the railroad started, got the tracks back on, started running, uh, and that soil under the tracks had not been dealt with. So uh, that soil will be removed. So the tracks will have to be taken up and that soil will have to be removed. You all, I believe, tested for vinyl chloride and hydrogen chloride, but experts have said that there might be other byproducts. Is the EPA testing for any other possible toxins, and is that being done independently? Also, can you speak to soil testing? So uh, we are doing an analysis of, of all of that. All of what you just described are things that we either have underway currently or will put underway. Uh, we have air monitoring, so we feel really good about that. Uh, justice for me would be making our town whole again, turning back the clock to February 2nd, 2022. That's the number one thing. Uh, your, your home is your sanctuary. If you don't feel safe in your home, you're never going to feel safe anywhere. So. How can you tell residents they're safe when there's questions in every possible whether every possible chemical is being tested for, including dioxins. I feel very confident in the technologies that we've deployed. We've deployed aircraft. We have mobile vans circling the community. We have stationary air monitoring strategically placed all across this community. We've tested the indoor air quality of over 550 homes. So our data is very solid. Are you testing for dioxins? I'm not quite sure if we are. Uh, testing for a dioxin, I know that that is under discussion and it's not something that's off the table. The testing of the soil uh, in yards and things like that you're hearing from residents, we don't know if we can walk in our lawn or in our yard. We can expand it so the whole system, so that if anybody uh, wants to be on the system, that they will be able to get off the system. That's a long-term issue, but it's something that we can, we can address. The EPA is obviously dodging information about dioxins throughout this presentation. If you could walk us through that decision of not digging up the soil and just rebuilding the train tracks over it. And second, it's been roughly three weeks. What new safety measures do you have in place since then? People need to see change in, in a big way. We believe that we had an environmentally sound remediation plan for the soil under the tracks. Of when you dump 100,000 gallons of chemicals, and oil. 
an oil. You're not talking about the 60, oil. 60,000 gallons of oil. When you dump that into the ground and you don't take that out of the ground before you put your tracks on and you run your train on it. You need to hire some new That's uh, an okay experts. decision. Ma'am. The oil is going to cause us the long-term effects. The chem Everybody's talking about the chemicals. And while I do think that's important, it's the oil that's seeping into our ground that you chose not to dig up and just put your tracks right over top of it. She's asking you specifically, what led you to that decision? Ma'am, we've made a lot of progress on environmental remediation. We've dug up 4,600 cubic yards of soil and collected 1.7 million gallons of water. We will continue with environmental re remediation. And in early March, we will start by tearing up the tracks and digging up the soil underneath the tracks. For six weeks, oil's gonna be soaking into our soil. So until then, we'll just have it keep going keep down. Keep going in, in our, our soils. Jenna, did you get all your questions answered? No, I did specifically ask what changes you've already made, and, and I think these residents also are, are very valid in asking, like, why the delay? Why can't we do it tomorrow? We're going we're gonna to test and we're going to calibrate all of our, the wayside detectors all across our system. And is that something that's visible for people to see? Is it publicly available for us to see that that's being done? It's an internal component to Norfolk Southern. We stood up a website. Whatever Norfolk Southern was doing almost three weeks ago wasn't sufficient in terms of safety. Because you are in charge of the company, you can make those changes. And yes, if you spend a billion dollars on safety, that's great. Of course, your profits are in the multi-billion dollars every year. What we had in place didn't work here. We're gonna figure this out. The people of East Palestine are just being treated like dummies. We're not dummies, we're smart people. Listen to these people, what they have found out about different things and everything else. I'm angry. I'm angry about this. I've lived in East Palestine for 65 years now. That's my home. My grandmother came from Germany. She lived in Palestine. My dad grew up there. My family's grown up there now. And it is disgusting. So, you know, I, I don't feel safe in this town now. You took it away from me. You took us away from this. But your company stinks. They're not watching what's going on. Supervisors make workers work. You gotta do something about it. I lost a lot. I lost the value of my home. I can throw a stone to that burner. What do we do now? I come back from Chicago for four days. I was in Chicago for four days. I came home the other day. I put the garage door up. I got pulled, we pulled in the garage, got out of the car, put the garage door down. As soon as we got out of that car, the smell came back to us. Right away, instant headache. I'm 65 years old. Did you shorten my life now? I want to retire and enjoy it. How are we going to enjoy it? You, you burned me. And it's in the air. Every day I cough. I've never had that. You know, I, I got rashes on my cheeks and all of my arms. I don't call it a derailment. I call it a disaster. It's Norfolk's disaster, not a train derailment. You seem like a family and a great guy and all. But you know what? Like I said, your, your company has to do something. Jim. Thank you for those comments. I, I'm terribly sorry that this has happened to this community. What I can do and what I will do is make it right. We're gonna get the cleanup right. We're gonna reimburse the citizens. I think you heard the mayor talk about, you know, making this community even better. We're looking for ideas from the community on where we can help and things that, that we can do. Will you buy them out of their houses at the property value so they can, so Jim can retire? We're, Step up. We're gonna do what's right for this community. Your derailment, did it change me now? It's changed, it's made me an angry man. I'm a Christian, I love the Lord. But you've made me angry. And I don't wanna be like that. I said, what? I lost everything now. I worked hard, at 40, I'm, working, I'm still working. I'm my 44th year at my job. Now I'm just stuck. An independent environmental tester arrives with a grim warning. Independent environmental scientist and chemical spills expert Stephen Petty is on the ground in East Palestine today testing air, water, and soil for residents skeptical of the government giving them the all clear. They're measuring something that doesn't tell you a lot about the individual chemicals. It's done because it's easy and quick to do. <laughs> it's not doesn't cost a lot of money. Petty has been an expert witness in dozens of the top environmental class action lawsuits in the U.S. While testing, we could hear trains passing every minute, a haunting reminder of why we are here. 
the public can handle negative news. They just want the truth. It's not wrong to tell them we don't know yet. Do you think they're getting the truth here? I don't think they've done enough. I think that they're being told too many positive things given the uncertainties. Environmental lawyer Stephen Donziger has battled the likes of Chevron and has a warning for the residents of East Palestine. The government has repeatedly, like historically, never really dealt directly um, and told the full truth about health risks that are faced by local communities that get hit with these major industrial accidents. I mean, the company detonated cancer-causing chemicals over a million pounds creating a mushroom cloud of poison. And the governor of Ohio, just a few days after this disaster, recommended people go back. There was no scientific basis. From what I've seen on some of the initial testing, they, they haven't necessarily tested for all the things I think we should be testing for, like the dioxins. And they're not testing for those? To my knowledge, they hadn't. The, the, there's pumps behind me. They're running 24 seven. They have been indefinitely. They're working to scrub the water clean, and they're not adding to the argument here that everything is safe, Nicole. They're telling me we can't diagnose them with chemical burns of the lungs because almost after three weeks, they're still waiting on guidance from the Ohio Department of Health. How long is it going to take? Are, are one of my children going to have to drop dead before they get guidance? They are only helping Norfolk clean up the mess that they refused to clean up. They threw dirt over it, laid those tracks down, and got them trains rolling. Even as we're doing this, another Norfolk Southern train rolling through town. Profit um, before people. We are in the same boat today as we were the first day they lifted that evacuation. Nothing has changed except everybody's getting sicker and sicker. They have ripped my life away from me. The NTSB releases their preliminary report, calling the wreck completely preventable. Addressing the people of East Palestine. I am so sorry. Over the course of my career, for well over 25 years, this was 100% preventable. We call things accidents. There is no accident. The critical threshold per Norfolk Southern is above 200 degrees upon passing the third detector with a temperature of 253 degrees above ambient. A critical alarm message sounded to slow and stop the train to inspect the hot axle. And during this deceleration, the wheel bearing failed and a fire ensued which damaged an additional 12 cars. On February 5th, responders mitigated the fire. They were carrying well over 115,000 gallons of vinyl chloride. The temperature inside one of the tank cars was increasing, which could result in a catastrophic explosion. As you know, the responders then scheduled a controlled venting of the five vinyl chloride tank cars to release and burn the vinyl chloride. The NTSB had no role in the vent and burn. We are not part of the vent and burn. The Federal Railroad Administration has guidance for how to conduct vent and burns. We will evaluate whether the vent and burn was carried out according to that guidance. All of those cars were placarded. The placards were plastic and melted. It's absolutely critical for problems to be identified and addressed early so these aren't run until failure. General public absolutely deserve to know whether they live or work near a hazmat route. These recommendations go toward urging railroads to work with community on the emergency planning, on routing, what should be routed and not routed through communities, and what information the general public and emergency responders need and deserve. We dig deep. We never go away to prevent this so East Palestine and other communities never experience this again. You have tried for many years, uh, and then Congress has at times uh, kind of undermined those for decades. You, the FRA, Congress has looked at, and yet not a lot of progress. I want to be clear. We have to make sure that what we're proposing as the NTSB is specific to this accident. That's our job. Our job is to determine how this happened and to issue safety recommendations to prevent this one from happening again. This is a community that has been devastated. They deserve to know what happened, how to prevent it from happening again. They deserve to have the right solution because what happens is everybody jumps to those solutions and then when we issue our final report, we get ignored. That 
It's frustrating. We need action on what would prevent that from happening again. That is our goal. And what I care about and the NTSB cares about, what would prevent this from reoccurring? Safety is the only thing we care about. Politics is left at the door. It is frustrating when our recommendations don't get implemented. And I tell you, it's particularly frustrating for our investigators when they go to another accident scene and say, I saw this. I saw this on this one. Why wasn't it addressed? She was very clearly not on board with the vent and burn. River Valley Organizing The community organizes its own town hall, independent of any authorities, to come together and discuss what they believe to be the facts of the matter. I'm watching my entire family, my community, and my best friends be poisoned slowly. And there are root crops that will take this stuff up. Dioxins can be produced when vinyl chloride is burned. As it was, Ohio senators sent a joint letter to the Ohio and U.S. EPAs urging them to monitor East Palestine for dioxin. We're going to burn vinyl chloride. That dioxin would be formed. It's criminal that they didn't come forward with that. Questions to the EPA Thursday about dioxins were not returned. Experts say this is an urgent matter, as dioxins do not degrade easily. Once they're in the soil, they can accumulate and eventually make their way into animals and people. Dioxins will hang around for a long, long time. One of them is the most toxic chemical ever tested. There's a reason, I think, why the government isn't testing for this and why if the EPA has made one major mistake in their testing, it was ignoring dioxins. Almost pretending like it didn't exist. If they don't do the testing for the dioxin, then people will never understand what the risks were they were facing here. It causes cancer, reproductive problems, developmental problems, immune system problems, diabetes. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But these are all subtle effects that will affect people over the life of their over their lives. It will contribute to their adverse health. There's a long history in the EPA. Our organization had a campaign. We wrote books, several of them, about dioxin from the mid-90s into the early 2010s. And EPA still has not released its final cancer assessment for dioxins. And they won't release it because when they did their risk analysis, they found the risk was so high that they would have to shut down good portions of the American economy. And for dioxins and chemicals like dioxins, once they are in the soil, they don't break down very easily. And another property of them is because they're big and heavy, they tend to start to accumulate in certain pools. And that includes some kinds inside of organisms. So we do have to think about whether over time... EPA had to know when they were going to burn vinyl chloride that dioxin would be formed. It's criminal that they yeah. didn't come forward with Do you have any idea why the U.S. government isn't testing for this? What I suspect is they're afraid that if they test for it, they'll find it. And because it's so toxic, that people will be justified in their concerns and their fears about what could happen to them. They they know better. The agency knows better. It's a long history of studying this, this chemical. And so the fact that they're avoiding testing for it speaks to me that they're afraid of Pandora's box. The United States government is afraid to test for this because they're worried about the implications. The fact that they're not worried about the people of this community instead is... I don't even have the words to describe that. This is not the first time this has come up. And this is how government responds to these kind of situations. And that's a problem. This country does not have a SWAT team, if you will. When something like this happens, there needs to be a team of experts to address the health risks. When you have an infectious disease problem, CDC flies it, contaminated food problem. Again, there's a team of people that come together with different expertise and they know what to do and they know how to test for what they need to test for. That doesn't exist for toxic chemicals. So you end up with the kind of chaos that's happening here. It's, it's a, something that's repeated itself in community after community. And that, that can't continue. It just can't continue. I actually made a phone call to try to find out what kind of testing was being done. Deborah Shore answered her phone call. He's the director of Region 5 US EPA. They were not testing for dioxins. And he said he didn't want to dismiss the concern over that. They consider dioxin toxic poisoning to actually last for three generations because it, it actually goes in and attacks the DNA. DNA is, you know, hereditary. The poisons, the dioxins, it is not water soluble, which opens up another can of worms in cleaning up after this.
Right. Currently, no one is testing for dioxin in East Palestine. The U.S. EPA is not testing for it. The Ohio EPA isn't testing for it. There really aren't even private tests that have been published for this. That's not headline news. Hey Amen. You can't keep your eyes blinded to something that is this big of a problem in a small town community. These people need prayers and all the help they can get because up to this point, the government wasn't giving them any. Dioxin is very, does not degrade very easily. It will be around for many, many, many years. And this has to be tested for fairly quickly because we're getting close to planting season right now. And there are root crops that will take this stuff up. Potatoes, carrots. They didn't even test for dioxin. Now, if you don't look for something, you're never going to find it. So, in my opinion, they weren't looking for something they didn't want to find. Now, I think what we're looking at is a dioxin problem. Okay. All of the symptoms I'm seeing people are having with the uh, chloroacne, you can have permanent disfiguration on your face, ears, the dioxins, and go to the liver. Unfortunately, they didn't ever go away. They just build up and build up and build up. So if you're talking animals, and particularly like dairy and cows, and it ends up in cow's milk, it ends up in cheeses and everything downstream of that. There are so many questions that were answered we simply don't know. But you're never going to know unless you look. I know that they haven't been exercising all of their vision to say, well, what possibilities are out there? Chemical reactions are pretty predictable. They should have known that what they did was going to create dioxins. And dioxins don't occur in the natural. The first thing is to stop the additional contamination and figure out which chemicals they were contaminated with and make a plan. What was thing that was really talked about today is that there's not one contaminant that was released. There's a suite of them. And whether or not it can be cleaned up to a safe level is another question as well. Testing is being done, but certain things are seemingly being left out that we know exists. I mean, the, the US EPA isn't testing for dioxins. That seems like a major red flag to me, I'm not an expert in this, but that's something that we see with these sorts of cleanups. You know, sometimes the cleanups prioritize cost, availability, and speed. And that isn't always the safest way to prioritize testing. So we have seen, so that's what we're really advocating for here is a complete picture. And it's not allowing the community members to determine their actual amount of risk that they're exposing themselves to. And it's so tough. I mean, prioritizing speed and money. These are people's lives we're talking about. These are people's children we're talking about. It's been driving me nuts seeing all of this stuff happening. And the things that we need to be testing for aren't being done. We had a, the gentleman holding his little newborn baby. I mean, how can we be a pretending we're caring about the residents in this town who frankly deserve way the hell better than they're getting? I, I don't even know what to say about it. I mean, that's a fair concern, a fair observation, and definitely what we're seeing now. I think the idea that we're not necessarily prioritizing the people, the problem is we're prioritizing reducing panic, which means they're prioritizing not sharing all the information. Right. And that's the challenge. They're making assumptions that this community, that these individuals can't make their own decisions about their own risk if they had all the information. So instead of allowing them to decide if it's safe or they're willing to accept the risk, they're taking that away from them and just giving them blanket answers, which is only causing confusion and mistrust. And that's not going to allow for a prolonged cleanup, which is what's going to be needed. This is a multi-year long, if not multi-decade long process. And it's going to be a really long time until we really see the true repercussions of our health in our community. Environmental heavyweight Aaron Brockovich arrives at the scene. I have never seen anything in 30 years like this. But I'm also here to tell you something that I think you're figuring out. Superman's not coming. No one is coming. Uh, I've been watching what tests do come out, don't come out. I've been reading the reports. You have 44,000 fish that have been killed. The numbers are rising. I want you to know that there's a lot of Norfolk employees that are coming forward with information that is extremely invaluable. If the Railroad Workers United wants to say they condemn what's happened. These chemicals take time to move in the water. They're going to need to implement soil vapor intrusion modeling. Believe us, it's coming. You have a high water table, you've got volatile organics on the top. As it moves underneath homes, it can vaporize. My job is to not tell you what you want to hear. My job is to tell you the information as it is. 19,000 gallons of herbicide dumped into the river in Dukes Beer, California. 
1992, up in Superior, Wisconsin, 15,000 gallons of benzene, which we're going to talk about in a bit, right? This happened 31 years ago. In North Dakota, 146,700 gallons of ammonia. In Paulsboro, New Jersey, 23,000 gallons of something that you are now familiar with, vinyl chloride. It was the same railroad that was operating the train that derailed it in your town. In the law, this is what we call notice, and we'll talk about this in a little more detail. We live in a society that chooses to ship the most dangerous chemicals ever made by man in rail cars right through populated cities. Prior Norfolk Southern train derailments in Tennessee, 10,600 gallons of sulfuric acid were released after this company derailed a train there. In 2012, in Paulsboro, New Jersey, 23,000 gallons of vinyl chloride were released after a derailment on a bridge in New Jersey. And of course, what just happened to you, 1.1 million pounds of vinyl chloride had to be released to keep your town from exploding. And what happened to you is a course of conduct that is repetitive, entirely preventable, but not prevented. 3,397 events classified as a derailment over 20 years. This is happening about every three days. Here in 2022, they had 770 cars carrying hazardous materials that were involved in accidents, up from just 79 cars in 2012. Their accident rate has gone up almost tenfold because they're spending $10 billion buying back their own stock as the maintenance budgets are trimmed. And just in the two years since 2020, their income has gone up by 62%. FEMA and the Department of Health field questions about dioxin the toxin. You're not currently te testing for dioxins. Um, there's no baseline prior to the accident. We've spoken to a few experts and scientists that say that the chemicals released are extremely dangerous um, to people in the area. So why is this still not being tested for? As I said, we don't have baseline information for dioxins. They are ubiquitous in the environment. They can be caused by wildfires, by backyard grilling, by a host of other normal activities in uh, human life. And without that information, it would be hard to attribute any level to the derailment. However, I'd like to put you in touch with our toxicologists because we are looking at it. Those are the scientists, and we trust science. Are residents going to be uh, getting answers to questions about health concerns? Or is there going to be more information given about the air, water, and, and soil testing? Well, I know we'll have our on-scene coordinators there to demonstrate the air monitors that have been placed around the community and brought into homes and can answer questions about air monitoring. I defer to our health partners. They can answer questions about but. You know, there are trucks arriving every day at these facilities from a wide range of sources. Uh, some of our Superfund sites, private waste, chemical manufacturers, a whole range of sources of hazardous waste. Are, that's why we have these permitted and verified landfills and incinerators. A question for the mayor or the fire chief. Three weeks post the derailment, you still have residents who are telling us they don't trust what's being told by officials. They're so skeptical of their water, be it municipal or well water. What do you tell your community who still has so many questions and doubts about the long-term impact of this derailment? Uh, we only can trust the subject matter experts. We have to rely on our uh, federal and state uh, agencies to give us that information. And what we're getting from them says that everything is good. I know there's definitely questions uh, about the rashes and, you know, the, the illnesses. I was like, I needed to go. My eyes were irritated. My throat was uh, closed up. Chest was tight. Couldn't breathe. I was coughing up gray stuff. And so I just had to go to the hospital. I said, what is this? And they quarantined me. And that's when everything went haywire and put me on the breathing machine and mm -hmm. oxygen tank and everything. And they kept me in there for four hours to kind of keep an eye out on me. And it's still, I mean, even with all that, the steroids and this, it's still, you can hear it. Yeah. yeah. Gosh. <coughs> Where was the hospital? I would like to see justice done to these people. Uh, three of my nieces, two of the two twins, uh, 
Stella and Jenna, they both have chemical burns of their lungs. They just got diagnosed two days ago and her sister as well. Her brother has high liver enzymes at this point. And all these are just, in, and at first it just seemed like it was okay. And it's not like a lot of situations where immediately you feel the impacts of what you just inhaled. So, uh, you know, we're working with the federal agency, EPA, uh, Department of Health, to try to get those answers for our community. So I know it's still ongoing, but I think there's a lot of unanswered questions and our residents are getting frustrated, but uh, we're, we're working as fast as we can to get them the answers. I do question, you know, the people getting rashes and stuff like that, what, what is causing it. Um, they are saying everything's safe and you know, we're taking them at their word, but we need to get to the bottom of what's happening. The EPA actually filed a complaint against them. Uh, in 2016, they were cited for exposing workers to toxic chemicals. Are you all aware of this track record from this company out of East Liverpool? And if so, uh, you know, would you, is there any type of assurance you can give people that everything would be okay sending these to East Liverpool? Good question. We did a compliance screen of each of these sites and they are currently in compliance and we can have inspectors in uh, collaboration with the state out there at any time. I could smell it. Mm -hmm. um, what do you smell? Like something burnt but somewhat sweet. Um, it's just a very odd smell. It, it burns your eyes. It's hard to breathe. 36 hours after the train derailment, I went into my shop and I was there for maybe five or ten minutes. My eyes were watering. At the beginning of this event, there was no communication. When you reached out and tried to, to reach somebody, you got the phone menus and the answering machines, and you didn't get a response. And so, you know, public trust is, it's gone in this area. Yeah. And um, who, who all agrees with the, if I can just get a show of hands, that the trust is at a low? When it comes to the state and federal, we're being ignored. That they don't care about us. Sometimes they, they give us a little lip service. I, I think one of the things that's being overlooked here is the long-term perception of East Palestine. The stigma that goes along with it has already affected our businesses. How? Um, we have a greenhouse. Uh, mm -hmm. Valentine's Day should be one of our big days. We had one customer. Um, no one wants to come here. You know what? They didn't know what they were walking into that night. And they were there all night and all the next day before anybody had a manifest that knew exactly what was burning. So shout out to all of them. And they came from far and wide. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. I've lived here 34 years. Um, I'd like to stay where I live. Um, I raised my family here. And it is depressing. I had four steers supposed to go to, to serve my customers. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have the information to say that there that, that, that wouldn't be a health liability if I did. I think one of the things that's caused so much mistrust here is the way Norfolk Southern handled this at the beginning. It took three days for them to tell us what was on the train. You know they knew instantly. I've asked this question a hundred times since this happened. Somebody made these chemicals. Somebody was receiving them. Those people know how to handle them and what to do with them, but they're not in the picture at all. Unfortunately, they cared nothing for the safety of this town or the surrounding area. I want to show you guys a video. That's who you voted for in that district. Donald Trump, who reduces all safety. I'm just curious what runs through y'all's heads. She should be ashamed of herself, honestly. She should come down here to everyone's face in this, this area and say those words. Then let's talk. I think that regardless of who you vote for, what your political affiliation is, mm -hmm. people are people and we're all Americans. Yeah. Her words were unkind and intellectually dishonest. Yeah. And um, they're not helpful. Mm -hmm. um, they, they add nothing to how we go forward. You know, I just hope that, uh, that the culture in this, in this country um, it changes to a point that we have compassion for one another. Yeah. The CEO gets to go home. This is our home. So I, I don't think we ever get back to where we are the way we were. I raised seven kids on my farm. This is a farm that I worked my whole life to be able to afford to buy. We've lived there about 18 years. It's about my kids. It's about them having home. Um, yeah, how do you get that back? Residents of East Palestine grow completely outraged. I am an uh, attorney, and it's my honor to represent. Hi, my name is Courtney. I just want everyone out there to know that I am fighting for East Palestine as hard as I can. I'm doing as much as I can. We are not alone. People behind me, very intelligent people that I've gotten a hold of, the testing that is being done, we will know the truth, and we will know it very soon. 
hopefully by the end of this week, if not by the beginning of next week, and I will have answers and I will make sure that we know exactly what is hurting all of us in East Palestine, everyone that has rashes, everyone that's coughing, everyone whose properties were destroyed, the creek behind my house that is destroyed, that my kids will no longer be able to play in, the fact that they told us that it was okay to come back and I stuck my hands in that creek. What is actually in that creek and what can it cause us in the long run? We're going to find out answers and we're going to make sure that people are held accountable for this. Thank you. I have 20 years experience as a senior industrial hygienist and an environmental specialist. I served nine years on active duty in bioenvironmental engineering and an additional time in the federal government working for the VA with a memorandum of agreement to deal with these types of spills. My issue with what happened is the absolute intentional lack of proper testing and risk communication. We look at all exposure routes of entry and what we do, which is what I have not seen come out of the EPA, is talk about synergistic toxicity and cumulative dose. See, the issue here is, is that people were sent back to their homes without fully identifying all of the toxicants and hazards, nor have I seen any dioxin testing. So we are here to make sure that the people of East Palestine are heard. Um, I will hand it over to my colleague, uh, Tammy Clark. What we have seen here has put the townspeople of East Palestine at great harm due to the lack of proper risk communication. Like Kristen said, they are not only not doing the proper testing, they are testing and sampling for what they want to find. They are doing surface water testing, not sludge and soil testing, for example. The people were sent back into their homes, and yet they were told that they should shelter in place five minutes before this blast, before this uncontrolled controlled burn, and yet they were not told how to shelter in place. Their HVAC systems were not shut off. They did not tape and seal their doors. They did not know to cover their vents. So everything that was burned was sucked right inside of every home and every business, and yet they were told it was perfectly safe to go back. Why do you think that they are sick, they are coughing, they're coughing up blood, their children are covered in rashes? This is horrendous, and the EPA knows, and we know that they know because they have trained us. We are government trained professionals who have worked in the private industry for many years. So we are here to stand with the people to help them to make sure our government agencies are held responsible. So I'll turn it back over to Cameron, but I just want the people of East Palestine to know you are not alone. We are working very hard to make sure that the government agencies who have put you at great risk and great harm are held accountable. Thank you. And they are going out of their way to conceal information and in prohibit people from gathering their own. Do you feel that the federal government in this has been transparent and open enough for your liking? No, they've lied through their teeth. I live about a football field away from where the train derailment happened. Um, it's about anywhere, about 100 to 200 yards, I would say. Um, I heard the screeching of the metal on metal, and I knew that that wasn't normal. I shot up out of bed. I was just getting ready to go to sleep. I just put my kids to bed. And then I heard the first boom, and then it went boom, 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 which was all the cars hitting. And then by the time I had looked outside, the flames had gone up above the tree line, and I could see it. It was probably a mile long worth of fire that we could see. It was, it was horrifying. Um, I've been coming and going as much as possible because I'm, I live so close. It's hard to breathe. Um, I lose my voice if I'm there for too long. I, and my nose are burning. My eyes burn really bad. They'll start watering. They'll turn really red and just start watering. Um, especially if I get too close outside to the creek where all of those chemicals were spilled into and apparently burned, but I can still see the swirls of the metallic rainbow color in the creek. And it, it, if you stir it up, it just releases more gas and stuff into the air, and you can smell that horrible smell. So if I go outside, I, I wear a mask just to cover it up because, like the kind that they use for spray painting and spraying pesticides, I use one of those masks because I can't take the smell, and then it's hard to breathe, and then I can't breathe. I feel like I'm trying to catch my breath constantly, like there's a lack of oxygen in the air. Um, me and my children's lives are the most important thing to me. I, a house is a house. I can buy another one, I can go elsewhere, but 
our lives are more important than materialistic things. I can easily drop it and walk away from it and have no repercussions that I would even fathom life without my children or their, them having to live without their mother. We're East Palestine strong and I'll fight as long as and hard as I can. What are the government's standards? Yeah, so an aspect of when I talk about the improper risk communication, the aspect of that is founded in the fact that until we know all hazards and toxicants and contaminants to life in the environment, we always treat the scenario as something called IDLH, immediately dangerous to life and health. In an instant hazardous materials response, you treat it as IDLH, which means you get all the people out of there and they do not come back until they've done testing Again, from all routes of injuries of exposure, and then you also have to look at what happens when different chemicals combine, and then they can create new hazards. So these different types of volatile organic compounds, the problem that we're seeing with as exposure scientists is we're dealing with contaminants that all have the same target organ. Does that make sense? So you're dealing with a claim of low exposure, but when the 10 chemicals all have the same target organ, we need to be honest about cumulative dose. So these people should not have been allowed back to their homes until they sample to get below what is background. And due to county records and the EPA, they know what things are naturally occurring in the soil. I am coming from the ethics of my profession that says until we have the data to disprove exposures, we treat it as a worst case scenario, which was, one not, which was not done. Like Courtney stated, they said to come back home, but they did not warn them about this sediment bringing everything back up and you have children that may be playing in it. That, that is so important, that communication, and that's what it was missing. If it's cows, they might eat that grass. Yeah. What do you think about that? So that is an issue with it being a rural area because dioxins is the primary hazard, which is a byproduct of burning these type of contaminants. And dioxins stay around in the environment for a very long time. And just like you said, you have to look at the whole ecosystem. You have you know, cattle eating the grass. You have animals even I'm no hopefully people are eating their animals but they're digging in the ground they're all this stuff is being spread around and it can become depending on the contaminants that are still unknown it can come back up into the breathing zone so this can get into the waterways it can get into the feed and then we're ingesting it through the dairy and the animal fat animal fat is where um, dioxins primarily reside in the body after they're exposed to it so this is why we're saying when we deal with chemicals we always track it from cradle to grave and that includes a spill. So we really can't say everything's okay. We're not at the cleanup phase right now. We're not at the remediation phase. What we should be doing right now is educating and doing the rightful thing of tracking trends of exposures. You can get thing called something called chloracne, rashes, contact dermatitis, uh, chemical pneumonia, and bronchitis. So we need to kind of pause. This situation is easy to get these people the help that they need. So we can one, assess exposures and then go back and do the proper decon of all these homes because like it was mentioned I don't know how these property values are going to cover from this and we just need to stop and assess all the issues that are a result of this improper uncontrolled controlled burn. Michael Regan addresses East Palestine High School. We have these stationary monitors, they're just air monitors placed strategically all across the community. What about we're worried about our animals being outside like in the grass? We are looking into the soil testing. You know, what I would say is take every precaution. It's one thing for me to say we believe based on the science that certain things are safe. It's another thing for you all to feel comfortable. And what I would encourage if you feel any kind of impact, health impact, or anyone in your family feels that, just immediately consult with your doctors. Just take every precaution you can that you feel comfortable with. I can tell you that I think things are safe and that might not be convincing. He seems like a nice guy and I want to trust the information, but just in case I want to take some few extra precautions, there's nothing wrong with that. No matter who you are or where you live, we are here to provide a safe environment for everybody. And EPA has been on the site of this disaster just hours after it happened. And we've been here since then. We're not going to leave until we finish the job. For in the summer when plants, crops, or hay are planted for them to like gain the chemicals in the soil? You know, we're going to do all of the necessary testing uh, that we need to do to alleviate that fear. And I think what we're going to have to do is, even though we don't believe that there's any contamination, we're going to have to mobilize 
a testing regimen to prove that that soil is uh, available for use. And even if we don't believe that certain things are happening, we may set up testing regimens just to give the community extra security. There's nothing like proving what we're saying. And so the idea of dioxins was brought up, and that is a big concern for people around here. But at this time, the EPA is not testing for the dioxins because there's not a base level. Wouldn't it be still beneficial to test for those dioxins in the soil? Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, from, a, from a, just a basic standpoint, dioxin exists whether you're burning a campfire or grilling out. This would be totally a different thing. It, it would. And so out. with everything that we are measuring for, we know what those levels are. Dioxin would be a byproduct. And so because we know that those measurements are below the health standards and we understand the impact of that, we can confidently say that we don't believe that there is a higher level of dioxin based on this accident. There is an outstanding question of what is the sort of baseline and dioxin footprint of the community. And I think that's something that we're willing to explore. I think that that's something that we want to follow the science and test. What we want to do though, is we want to keep our resources focused on what we believe to be the most immediate threat to the community. Uh, I, I just wanted to sort of be clear from our vantage point what the science says, that dioxin as a byproduct of this disaster being elevated well, we just don't believe that to be true. But again, we want to alleviate the concerns of the community. Those that were possibly exposed to all these chemicals, do we know if there's going to be any negative effects on their health? We don't believe that there's any cause for danger right now. I think that we have to get this cleaned up and make sure that if there was short-term exposure that we don't elongate that and have longer-term exposure. We want to be sure that we're not exposing anyone any longer than need be making sure that the people in the community feel that every box is being checked. There's a difference between what we believe to be scientifically true and what we need to do to prove to the community that you all should be safe. You're teaching strong science here. <laughs> I think this, I can't stress this enough, we have to believe in science and we can't let conversations take us away from science. But once you establish that and the science says something, then there's the next step of, well, what do we need to do to ensure that people actually believe the science? Walk people through why we believe such to be true. So that you all not just hear me repeat the science and say, trust me, but also we will try to prove to you all and provide the evidence that what we're saying is true. And, and the mayor raises a very good point, which is unless you visit a community, you might not be able to prioritize as well. It's one thing for me to sit in Washington, D.C. and say, well, I've seen other communities that have experienced this and this is what they've liked. Being on the ground and talking to you all, it helps me to prioritize. Well, that's now a high priority for me. Anything that we need to do to go above and beyond is safe to be in your community in certain places, and in certain places it's not. That's important to us, and we want you all to know that. Some rivers were impacted more than others. There could be some seepage coming from somewhere else, and it could be a slow drizzle into that. And so we want to be sure that not only we, we clean up the creek, but we're cleaning up the point where the pollution is coming from. We want to be extra cautious. We, we may say, hey, we've done what we need to do to get that pollution out of the water. But we also don't want to find out two or three weeks later there was some pollution coming from another place that we didn't know about. We're going to do it as quickly as we can, and we're going to do it in a way where we don't want to be disruptive. There were people cleaning up the creeks, and like you guys might be walking by and say, hey, what's going on? And the people on site weren't willing to explain it to you. Open up and say, this is what we're doing. This is where we think we are. We don't want to keep you all guessing. We want to be able to say, this is exactly what we're doing and why. First of all, I think that we all acknowledge that a disaster occurred. There are going to be a lot of things on Facebook and on television. You don't have to necessarily believe me 100%. You know? I think I'm credible, but I don't mind checks and balances. Number one, the people at EPA, they've seen this happen in other towns and cities all across this country for decades. So we know what to look out for. And I firmly believe that there doesn't have to be a black eye on this city. And even if somebody doesn't want to come back next week, the goal is to make people feel comfortable and play you guys in sports. You know, even if you're competing against other teams, I think what we try to do is not be defensive and understand that people do have genuine questions and concerns. And so they may raise questions out of a genuineness. And I think it's safe for you all to say, listen, these are the facts. This is what's happening. Come to our turf and we're gonna, we're gonna beat the daylight out of you. I think it's gonna be an ongoing conversation. Say everybody, let's just be honest about it. And I think just walking people through that process of actually what we're doing and how we're doing it. We don't trust the air quality in your gym. We bring the equipment into the gym 
and then we do some air quality monitoring in the gym, outside of the gym, and then we provide that data to the school. The only thing we can do is work hard to earn people's trust, and we know we're not going to change people's minds overnight. Some of the concerns were some of the chemicals people were saying were plastic related, so they were worried that those chemicals would get like stuck to the turf and things. Mm -hmm. So is that possible that that happened? Or? I think number one, having this kind of conversation with a scientist or an engineer would be good for you all in terms of who you're talking to, to hear specifically why that isn't the case and how we know that's not the case and how we'll continue to monitor it so that we can prove to you all it's not the case. We would like to be citizen scientists and we would like to do water, air monitoring, collect data. You guys crunch the numbers because we don't know what we're doing, but we would love somebody to come in and talk to us about that. Not that we don't trust the government, but we trust what we find. We trust sure. our science. Even if we do crunch the numbers, uh, we'd like for you all to understand how we're crunching those numbers and be very transparent. You know, the mayor says that this, we all wish this would have never happened. And if we could go back to that day before, we'd all be better off. We got to take this journey together. What is going on with like people who people are afraid to buy the beef, afraid to buy the eggs, like they don't know if it's safe. So like, what is going to happen with all of that? That's a really good question and taking a very close look at it. It's a very important question. When the trains go by the houses that are closer to the incident that happened, do the chemical levels in the air increase? We are very closely monitoring so that we can alleviate much of this concern. Uh, we're going to take every precaution we need to take. Uh, how is Norfolk Southern handling this? You know, um, I would say that um, right now if I had to give them a grade, it would be incomplete. You know, you all put together a, a town hall very early on and, and they didn't show up to answer these questions. But right now, we're watching them like a hawk. Uh, we're not leaving any stones unturned. Michael Regan addresses East Palestine. I'm excited to share that EPA's Community Welcome Center is now officially open for business. So we're encouraging members of the community who have questions to please visit us here. Uh, but I want to be clear also, uh, I have heard the students, uh, we have had conversations about dioxin, what they perceive to be potential impacts. I'm taking that information back, back to Washington, D.C., um, and when the actions were taken, uh, we were there to monitor uh, the air quality impacts. It, it was determined that was the best course of action. It's governed by the uh, federal EPA, so therefore, you know, this, it should be safe for all the citizens there. I understand the questions surrounding dioxin. I listen to students, state, um, uh, I mean, local leaders, uh, business, local business owners, and we're taking that information back. Uh, I want folks to understand we hear them loud and clear and understand those concerns. There are no gaps in the testing. Uh, and if there are gaps, and lots of people have lots of opinions, uh, if there are gaps, uh, we want to address those gaps. What we want to do is close the information gap. Uh, one of the reasons we've opened this storefront is so that people can feel comfortable coming in and getting this information. And we're continuing to work with the community to develop strategies on how best to engage the community and get them that necessary information. Uh, yes, absolutely. Communities have a right to know, uh, which is why there was a brief pause where they had contracts in place. And as this material is moving, the appropriate authorities have the appropriate information so that the communities are not alarmed. You know, there have been many residents here who have indicated uh, that they worry about some residual. Uh, while we don't believe that there are any adverse health impacts as it relates to the derailment, uh, this is an additional step we're taking uh, to alleviate concern and lower the angst. And so what we're providing is an in-home or in-business thorough cleaning service. Uh, but what I can say is that we are working as fast as possible. Uh, if, there are, if there's anyone that is experiencing any kind of adverse health impacts uh, immediately, we ask that they consult medical professionals. Air quality testing in the states, uh, water quality testing uh, has, has not yielded any adverse health impacts uh, that we have seen at this moment. And so we're going to be laser focused on the cleanup. We believe very strongly in our response to this emergency. Uh, but there are some things that the communities have expressed, like concerns uh, that their homes may have, you know, have some dust or some particles that they'd like to have cleaned. Would you allow your kids anywhere close to these screens right now? I, I would not. I'm a father of a nine year old. Uh, the accident occurred. This is an ongoing effort to, as a, to efficiently and effectively 
clean up the mess that Norfolk Southern caused. They're actually aerating a creek. Where do you think those chemicals are going in an aeration process? They are literally going back up into the air. That's that's not the way you do it either. The director of the EPA saying this, so you're saying... I'm saying I disagree. What the EPA is doing is wrong. Yes. I don't see an off-gas system over there, so I don't know what they're doing in that tank. The problem that's going to be in this community for a very, very long time is when they go underneath this community, every one of these homes here has a basement, and they're going to start experiencing what they call soil vapor intrusion. There's cracks in those basements. Ten years from now, that's those soil vapor plumes are still going to be coming up in those houses. They change with rainfall and precipitation, acting like a hypodermic needle and pushing those chemicals up into the basements. The sun and the oxygen destroy it really quickly. It's when it gets trapped in the Vado zone. That's the area of soil between the top and the groundwater. And that stuff migrates. Okay, and it sticks in the soil, and then the water goes down, and then the water goes back up, and it's like a giant tea bag, and it constantly recontaminates itself. The activities are, are, are basically done in a fashion as if they're like trying to fool the community. They sent out somebody, two guys with a, a mask from Home Depot, tanks on their back like they were spraying herbicide, and they went through the house and sprayed organic disinfectant all over the furniture. You don't disinfect vinyl chloride spill. You don't disinfect dioxin. You don't disinfect, you know, any of these chemicals. I can't believe that they would do that. I think it was literally to lull the community into shutting up. And certainly we don't know what, what cocktail of chemicals went into that burn pit during the burn. What did they turn into when they burned? You know, what other stuff was mixed in there? I, that's where the transparency is lacking. I mean, we don't know. I just want to get Aaron in. Very oh, quickly. Aaron. So, do you have any questions? They are so afraid. They get so many mixed messages. They're getting a total runaround. They want help. They make a phone call. It goes to Norfolk. Then it says call EPA. EPA says call Norfolk. They don't know where to go. They want to leave. They don't have the means to leave. People aren't coming back. Their animals are sick, their animals are dying. I've just seen pictures of them who go to their own doctor with holes in their throat, or they're being diagnosed with chemical respiratory illness or these rashes that obviously look painful. Listen, this has been going on for three weeks since the initial crash. I think we're pushing a month now, actually, March 3rd. And yet nothing has really been done that is really giving them any kind of help or answer. It's so frustrating. It's classic cover-up in an environmental disaster and running the people around in hopes that they don't figure it out or we all go away. The lack of mismanagement here is unbelievable. You have I mean, everybody's seen the pictures. The pictures I was seeing up close, what was burning, the smells. Of, it was very overwhelming to have such a close perspective today of what they went through. And, and I've been on a lot of environmental situations and I've never seen anything in my life be so mismanaged, ever. You guys are around town. They're doing all this aeration that could be throwing chemicals into the air. You just had independent testing come out that shows it's in the air. And then EPA Director Regan says yesterday, maybe you should keep the kids away from there. Well, maybe you should have told us that three weeks ago because they've already been down here. It's just awful. And I'm truly, I have spent all morning with these people, I am truly upset. I cannot imagine what they've been through. But they all have the same story within this one mile radius and outside of it. They have Norfolk wanting to do tests. And their well water is, you know, all these colors, they're worried. That doesn't, they don't know what it means. What does it mean it smells? What does it mean when I come home I can't breathe? And then the frustration that they just get run around. Every call to every agency leads right back to Norfolk. They are not stupid. They are not making things up. And they're sick. It's, you guys really need to hear from these people. We just want answers. 
Just answers. Need answers. And we're not getting them. And not one senator, governor, EPA, or Northfolk come down our streets. We're just hearing it through you guys and social media. Conflicting stories. We want answers, that's all. And that's wrong. So please explain to them to come to our street. My daughter has a rash around her neck, upper cheeks. Call 800 number, call this number, call that number. No good. And everyone's hired by Norfolk Southern. My daughter's, you know, hey, and it's not fair. Not fair. So I want the answers, that's all. And that's we're all not we're, getting Everybody wants everybody the answers. Wants. I'm raising three granddaughters. Um, they've had rashes. They've been sick. Giovanni's daughter has been sick after going to school. And they're trying to force us back into our homes and make, go to school and it's, say it's all right, but the kids are sick, and we, I, I will not tolerate that. We need answers, and we got to get these kids healthy, and if not, get out of town. She's getting our word out there. We just sat around and talked for a while, and it was awesome. I mean, it's just like talking to a friend, and she's not promoting nothing, and we just want to get this taken care of. We want Norfolk Southern to pay and get this done. I've lived here my whole life. This is a third train wreck that I've seen in my lifetime in this town, and it's the worst, and we want to get this done. I've lost 15 pounds because I'm up every night worrying about my granddaughters. Like, what am I, am I exposing them to something that's going to hurt them down the line? I'm 61, I'm not worried about myself, but I, I worry about them. They're my responsibility, and we got to get answers. I'm more or less so worried about who's supervising Norfolk Southern. I mean, it's supposed to be the EPA, but when the decisions were made to, to put a big hole in our town and dump oil in it and whatever else it was, because we really have no idea what it was, who, whose decision was that? Was Governor DeWine there to ask any questions as to is this really the best idea, or was it just Norfolk Southern making all the calls and people just agreeing like puppets? We're not puppets, we're people. We live here. I mean, I've been here since 2018. Um, honestly, I didn't think much of the community until I got to know people. I mean, I come from like the Youngstown area. It's a little bit busier, a little bit crazier, a little more hectic, a little more something to do. I mean, you come here and it's nice and peaceful and quiet. So until you get out of your shell and meet other people where they are, that's how you meet people like these guys. So I just met this gentleman today. I met her today. I, I know Greg, he's taught my daughter basketball. I mean, it's not just a small hick town where people don't make money because there's a lot of successful people here that own properties and own assets and the way they portrayed us on the news in the very beginning, which took like a week, by the way, because we were all hashtagging all of you guys and all the government officials. I mean, it's just crazy. Like we're not in a third world country. This is sad, very sad. So when this all first started, I hired someone to clean my house. And when I went down there for reimbursement, I was denied reimbursement because I didn't use who they contracted. Shouldn't it be my choice, the people's choice? We're in the United States. Well, they should pay. Is it hard to we cut a check for a different business other yeah. than the one you want me to go to? Come on. It's not hard. I write checks all the time. It's not hard. You know that. Some people would move in because it's cheaper real estate. I mean, I don't know. But since we've been from the evacuation to now, we've had many symptoms and like issues and respiratory problems and headaches and fighting vertigo. I mean, I had to fly my mom to California because she couldn't breathe here anymore. I mean, that's, you know, that's not something I need to do. That messes up my whole 10-year plan that I have going on as a 31-year-old 30, person. You know, self-employed, halfway retired. That messes up a lot of things for people. All of this. And no accountability. We're all trying to come together. Thank, thank God we have Aaron. And, like, we all have different pieces of information based off of the derailment. You know what I mean? That we're able to kind of piece together as citizens, but why do we have to do that? Where's the EPA? Why aren't they working for us? When we ask questions, they're directed not to tell us anything. So we're supposed to feel safe. We're supposed to feel like they're working for us. It's all bull crap. You guys know this. It went from 4,032 cubic yards of soil. Now it's down to like 3,000, you know, that contaminant soil at ground zero. Who is holding them accountable? You didn't make one mistake, you made two. You wrecked into us and then you blew us up. Why are those lids open if they're vacuuming up bad water? Yes. <laughs> Anyone see that? Questions. Anyone notice that? Not those answers. lids are wide open for everyone to consume. But we're told everything's fine and everything's in order. It's not in order, guys. You know this. Come on. That's who you should be talking to, the citizens. 
They're the people you need to hear from, not your politicians. There's your story. Your people are the citizens of East Palestine, not the mayor, the governor, the senators, which they're a proper. Need to talk to the people of East Palestine, not these conference meetings and just getting stories. Get our stories, not their stories. When I went down there and looked, the militia are open on all four of those stands. So they're, they're not even in service. <laughs> there you have it. So we know East Palestine was both preventable and deliberate negligence, yet nobody responsible is behind bars or even held slightly accountable in any meaningful or significant way for this crime against humanity. I've reported diligently on this topic because it lights me on fire to hear news reporters talking with zero business expertise is only earned through real life deal making. Let me tell you firsthand until one of these fellas in a suit coat gets to spend a serious amount of time in a place that looks like this, the safety of all innocent citizens will never be properly valued in their quarterly profit and loss statement. I'd say, in fact, every time we can point to a completely preventable crime against humanity, especially one obviously directly tied to corruption at the highest levels, such as with precision scheduled railroading, I'd say several of these gentlemen in suit coats could afford to spend a fair amount of time thinking about their actions. Especially when the initial response from Allen amounted to $5.31 per resident in exchange for derailing their whole lives for a month now. And suddenly, weeks later, we're learning that they lied and drenched everyone in dioxin. Clearly, these executives are simply out of touch with the consequences of their actions. So let's just do some simple math, shall we? If you get drunk and disorderly in a bar, say it takes 15 minutes for them to have you in a squad car. Alan Shaw drenched East Palestine in dioxin nearly a month ago and still walks as a free man. The drunk in a bar disrupted maybe 50 people for maybe 15 minutes. That's a total of 12 hours. Alan Shaw has disrupted maybe 5,000 people for a month now. That's... 416 years so far. The drunk gets thrown in the drunk tank overnight, society calls it even. So 30 years apiece for these chemical terrorists, maybe society could call that even. Yeah, that's my recommendation. To the state's attorneys general, 5,000 counts of gross criminal negligence for a total of 30 years jail time per Norfolk Southern executive. That would be a fair place to start, in my opinion, but this is a democracy. So instead, let's put it to a vote then. What do the residents of East Palestine think? If you don't know what to think, I asked the super intelligent chat GPT for answers for all of us. Here's what it said. Which dioxin variant would be suspect at the scene of a vent and burn of 10 cars full of vinyl chloride? The most likely dioxin variant that would be present at the scene of a vent and burn of vinyl chloride is TCDD. What are the least and most toxic dioxin variants? The least toxic is OCDD, and the most toxic is TCDD. Norfolk Southern and the EPA failed the test for dioxin at the site of a vent and burn of tank cars full of vinyl chloride. Might this be considered criminal? And which laws might that have violated? The failure to test for dioxin at the site of a vent and burn of tank cars full of vinyl chloride could be considered criminal if shown that they acted with gross negligence in violating applicable laws and regulations. The following laws or regulations may have been violated. The RCRA, a federal law, governs the management of hazardous waste from cradle to grave. If the vinyl chloride released from the cars is classified as hazardous waste under the RCRA, Norfolk Southern and the EPA may have violated the law by failing to properly manage and test for the presence of dioxin at the site. 
CERCLA, a.k.a. Superfund, is a federal law providing for the cleanup of hazardous waste sites. If the vent and burn site is determined to be a hazardous waste site under CERCLA, Norfolk Southern and the EPA may have violated the law by failing to properly investigate and clean up the site, including testing for the presence of dioxin. The Clean Water Act is a federal law regulating the discharge of pollutants into navigable waters of the United States. If the vent and burn released pollutants into nearby bodies of water, Norfolk Southern and the EPA may have violated the Clean Waters Act by failing to properly test and manage the pollution. If criminal charges are pursued, it would be up to the prosecuting authority to determine whether there is sufficient evidence to support a criminal prosecution and whether that evidence meets the legal requirements for charging and convicting individuals or organizations of criminal offenses. The EPA is defending their actions by saying dioxin is an everyday chemical released by regular human activities such as a bonfire. Is that fair or does it grossly misrepresent the relative difference in different dioxin variants? The EPA's defense that dioxin is an everyday chemical released by regular human activities such as a bonfire is not entirely fair as it ignores the fact that different dioxin variants have vastly different levels of toxicity. While it is true that dioxins can be formed as byproducts of certain types of combustion, such as the burning of wood or garbage, it is also true that some dioxin variants, such as 2378-tetrachlorodibenzo-P dioxin or TCDD, the most toxic dioxin variant can cause a range of serious health effects even at very low concentrations. Comparing the toxicity of TCDD to that of other less toxic dioxin variants, such as octachlorodibenzo-P dioxin, reveals that the EPA's defense does not accurately represent the relative differences in toxicity between different dioxin variants. While both TCDD and OCDD are technically dioxins, the toxicity of TCDD is orders of magnitude higher than that of OCDD, and exposure to even tiny amounts of TCDD can have serious health effects. It is important to accurately characterize the toxicity of different dioxin variants and to take appropriate measures to minimize exposure to those that are highly toxic, such as TCDD. This includes a proper management of the hazardous waste and pollution, as well as monitoring and testing of potentially contaminated sites to ensure that appropriate cleanup and mitigation measures are taken. Is it fair for the government to conveniently not address dioxin in order to avoid public fears and concern about the widespread release directly into their atmosphere? No, it is not fair for the government to conveniently not address the issue of dioxin in order to avoid public fears or concerns about the widespread release directly into the atmosphere. The government has a responsibility to be transparent with the public about potential risks to human health and the environment, especially in situations where hazardous substances have been released into the environment. Failing to address the issue of dioxin and its potential health effects would be a disservice to the public as it could prevent individuals from taking appropriate precautions to protect themselves and their families. In addition, it could lead to a loss of trust in government and other regulatory bodies tasked with protecting public health and safety. How far will the dioxin spread over five years after vinyl chloride is vented and burned? It is difficult to predict with certainty how far dioxin may spread over a period of five years after vinyl chloride is vented and burned. The spread of dioxin will depend on many factors, including the amount and concentration of dioxin released, the environmental conditions in the surrounding area, and the extent to which the dioxin is transported through air, water, and other media. Dioxin is a persistent organic pollutant that can travel long distances through the air and water. 
Its movement can be influenced by factors such as wind patterns, precipitation, and temperature. In addition, dioxin can adhere to soil and other surfaces, where it can persist for years and be transported through runoff or erosion. Given the persistence and mobility of dioxin, it's possible that it could it it is possible that it could spread over a wide area over a period of just five years after a release event. However, the actual extent of the spread will depend on many factors. As mentioned above, it is important to note that the health effects of exposure to dioxin are cumulative and can take years to manifest, so continued monitoring and testing will be necessary to assess the long-term health impacts of this dioxin release.